Yeah. Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV online in association with ORIF to introduce today's speaker and topic. I hand over to the secretary of ORIF, Dr. Janki Badani. Thank you so much, Neera sir. Uh, so, welcome to the platform or Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation India. Today we have our chairman, Dr. John Mukhopadhyay sir, who is teaching us about capital fracture and its management, surgical tips and techniques. So over to you, sir. So good evening, everybody. Today we're going to talk about uh, trochlea, the shear fractures of the distal humerus. And remember, these capillary fractures are really uncommon injuries and form only about 1% in all of all the elbow injuries uh, and about 6% of distal humerus fractures. Uh, it's more common in women than in men, and it's associated with radial head fractures and elbow dislocations. Uh, along with, uh, uh, the, you can also have shear injuries along with distal humerus fractures, but we are not going to really consider that today. Okay, so the mechanism of injury is usually a fall on outstretched hand or flexed elbow. There's axial loading on the capitalum through the radial head. Uh, the maximal force that is transmitted through the radial head is at about 0 to 30 degrees flexion on the capitalum. And the capitalum is susceptible to shear forces as its center of rotation is 12 to 15 millimeters anterior to the, that of the humeral shaft, okay? is anterior to the humeral shaft. Now, if you look at the historical aspects of this injury, this was first described by Hahn in 1853 and Stenthal in 1898 and was known as the hahn stenthal fracture. Uh, there's a second type added by Lorenz, which was just a thin shell of the bone known as the cocal Lorenz fracture. The third time with comminution and an involvement of a greater part of the capitalum was added by Brian and Maury. Okay, so these were the three types which uh, were known for many years till uh, McKee uh, in 1996 uh, proposed a fourth type which involved the trochlea as well. So the type four involves actually not just the capitalum uh, and uh, part of the trochlea, but the entire trochlea as well. Okay, the classical sign of this injury where more than just the capitalum is involved is this uh, double arc that you see on the lateral x-ray, which should tell you that it is not just the capitalum that is involved. Now, the AO classifies these all as partial articular fractures, and uh, they come in the B group, and the coronal shear fractures come in the B3 group. So all these Shear fractures come in the 13 B3 group of fractures. Uh, a useful classification is that of Double E et al. in January 2006, which uh, divided them into three parts, which was based on its involvement of just the capitular part, the capitalum, and the trochlea, or type three, where there was involvement of both with with uh, uh, comminution. And then there was A, B, A type and B type depending on the integrity of the posterior wall. And this has some bearing on your management because if the posterior wall is fractured, then you can't just fix these with front to back or back to front screws. Okay. Now, remember that these fractures are often much more complex than they look on x-rays. So you would do your standard AP and lateral views. Earlier on, the oblique views uh, a little more about this fracture, but today we have the CT scans. And really for these shear fractures, it's essential to get CT scans because without the CT scan, it is really difficult to uh, tell the whole nature of the fracture. For example, you see this on the AP and lateral x-rays, and you know there's a capital fracture, you might be able to say there's a double shadow, so it involves a little more than just the capillum and involves the trochlea. Uh, the obliques, again, show you a little more, but it's really the CT which will show you that there's involvement, there's uh, comminution, and there is 
involvement of this entire trochlear region right up to the medial side. Okay, so this is very hard to tell just on x-rays and therefore uh, this is essential to get CTs for these fractures before you plan your surgical treatment. Now, interestingly, there's a whole wide management uh, 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 sort of uh, techniques which have been proposed, including closed reduction, surgical excision, and open reduction and internal fixation. Although today, uh, open reduction and internal fixation would be the standard way of managing most of these fractures. Uh, the closed reduction, as it was proposed, was uh, to give traction to the supinated forearm in 90 degrees of flexion. And then you put downward pressure over the capitulum by your thumb. And if this is successful, you would cast it in this position in three to four weeks. And this is a technique which is really not practiced very often. Uh, personally, we have not even tried it. But uh, it says that it is possible to reduce some of these fractures and then you would cast them for three to four weeks. And maybe in a patient who is uh, not fit for surgery, this could be an option that you might try. Surgical excision, again, can only be considered in type two lesions where there's really just a shell of bone, which is not feasible to fix. Uh, would never, would again, not something that we consider in fresh fractures, but we have done it sometimes for old fractures. For example, this lady who came to us six months after the injury, and you can see there's a, just a thin shell of uh, the capitular bone. And here, what we did was we just excised it and then did an arthrolysis, and she ended up with quite a good result. But otherwise, if it's a significant part of the capitulum, you would still try to fix it, as I'll show later on. Now, how do you do your open reduction and internal fixation? So for most of these, we would use a lateral approach. Occasionally, you would use a posterior approach. And this is more common for the double E type uh, B lesions where the posterior wall is not intact. And you might consider putting a uh, screw through plates from the back into the capitula. Okay, so uh, once you do get that approach, you need to reduce the fracture, fix them temporarily with KVAS, and then do your definitive fixation which could be a combination of things. You could use cancellous screws, you could use Herbert screws or headless screws, or you could use threaded K wires to get fixation onto these fractures. Also, as I mentioned, sometimes you would use the distal humerus plate with the flange. And I'll show you one such example where you can put screws from back to front onto the capitulum and then through the flange into the trochlear region. Okay, so just going through some relatively simple cases. Here's a, a young gentleman with this uh, uh, young patient with this fracture. You can see here we've just used two uh, uh, fixations from back to front because the posterior wall was intact. One's a uh, screw and the other is a threaded K-wire with a washer. And this is a you know, follow-up at seven months showing a perfectly normal result. Here's another case. Now here you can see that it's more than just the capitulum involved. If the fracture goes on to a part of the trochlea, and then through the lateral approach, you can see how this uh, fragment tends to sit out and uh, actually uh, come in the anterior aspect of the radial head. And therefore, it's important to reduce this. Here, what we did was fix it through, one, through with one uh, back to front screw and then another threaded K wire which went across from the lateral side into the medial part. So this was being held on to the rest of the trochlea as well with this threaded k -Y. And this is a six month follow-up on a showing a um, almost normal range of motion. Now, as I said, you can have involvement not just of the posterior wall, but also of the lateral wall. And here you would need to buttress this part uh, with some, uh, with a plate, Usually we use a one-third tubular plate which we mold a little bit and fix it. So again, you can see the fixation of in the anteroposterior direction and then a buttress plate for the uh, lateral uh, epicondylar fracture uh, with the additional threaded wire going through that. And this is him at follow-up again with a reasonable functional result at the end of it. When you have medial trochlear involvement, it becomes a, a bigger problem. 
and then you have to decide how to approach it because it may not be possible to see the entire thing from the lateral side. So here is an example where we've gone from the medial and lateral side. So in the lateral side, we've uh, got the capitalum part of it reduced. Uh, and then from the medial side, you can see uh, how the trochlea is involved and you need to fix that here. You put this wire from front to back and then another wire across. So we've got this multiple wires uh, fixing this uh, from both sides. And again, you can see over the period of time, he's gone on to have a reasonably good function of this uh, fracture. Here's another example. Again, as you can see, the x-rays don't show you the whole extent of the fracture. But when you see the CT, you can see the involvement of the medial as well as the lateral side, as well as the lateral epicondyle. So there it is in multiple uh, views and the CT, 3D CT scans, again, which show you clearly what you need to do. And here again, it was a combination of a medial and lateral approach to get things adequately reduced. And this went on to do quite well. And this is a longer term follow-up with almost a full range of motion there. Uh, here's another patient. Uh, again, you can see the lateral epicondyle involved as well as the top plane involved. And here, uh, there is, as you can see, on the CT scan uh, involvement with uh, trochlear involvement as well as the medial side involvement. Okay, So here what we've done is we've used this uh, plate from the posterior aspect, as I mentioned earlier, and then we have this screw going across from the medial side. So we have screws from the plate fixing the capitula and through this flange fixing onto the medial side. Okay, so that's another way of fixing these fractures. And sometimes you may need this, where, especially whether there's combination of the posterior wall. Okay, now isolated trochlear fractures is very rare. And I think in our whole time so far, in many years, we've probably seen just two cases. Uh, it's easy to miss and you really need the CT to diagnose it. So here you can see uh, just this part of the trochlea is involved. There's no medial fracture, there's no lateral fracture, just this trochlear part is involved and here you need to get adequate exposure in this case it was done through the uh, lateral approach and fixed with this threaded uh, sort of headless screw from back to front from front to back and a k wire going across uh, we also have uh, late presentations okay so uh, one is when they come to you fresh and second is when they come to you after some time maybe four to six weeks or even later after the injury. And then it becomes a difficult problem and you really need to look at what the clinical problems are before deciding. Many of them also present with stiff elbows and in that situation, you are probably you probably will need to do something. Again, excision of the fragment is easy, but if it's a big fragment, you need uh, to try and mobilize the fragment and reduce it and fix it. So. Here's an example where patient presented to six weeks. Again, this involved part of the trochlea. So we uh, dissected it all out, did an arthrolysis, got a secure fixation with a combination of threaded wires and plain K wires. This was a follow-up after six weeks. This is in three and a half months, and this is after one year. We eventually had almost a full range of motion. Here's another lady. Again, you can see how this uh, capital of fragment will abut on the radial head and therefore cause problems over a period of time, even will cause uh, deformation of the radial head if it remains like that. And here you need to get it reduced adequately and fix them. And you can see uh, how they've gone on to have a good functional result after fixation. Now you also have patients who come to you. Sorry, uh, you also have patients who come to you after there's failure of fixation. Okay, here's a patient who was fixed with these wires. Now, this is a really difficult situation where, as you can see, that the fracture has not been reduced, the wires are not doing anything, plus they're prominent and causing a problem. And he had a grossly stiff elbow. So here, again, you need to do 
a complete uh, sort of revision of it. You need to remove the K wires. You need to mobilize the elbow. You can see the CT scans. They're showing you how that fragment is still unreduced. And that's the intraoperative picture after the wires have been removed. And we need to sometimes literally get this fragment out and then go ahead and fix it adequately. Uh, we don't have a follow-up on this patient, but this was the uh, what we were able to achieve on the table and the post-operative x-ray. And he was doing quite well, but uh, I think uh, through the COVID period, he has not come to us for follow-up. So we're going to need to chase him for follow-up. This is a 59-year-old lady who presents six months since her fixation. Uh, and uh, there you can see how uh, we've had to take out the previous fixation, get this fragment reduced and fixed adequately. Uh, in spite of that, she had uh, quite a bit of restriction of motion. So this was the amount of motion she had even under anesthesia. So here we went in and did an arthrolysis. You can see all these fibrous adhesions. You can see the articular surface is fixed quite well. So we were able to do an arthrolysis, get back a full range of motion on the table. And luckily, she was able to maintain this range of motion in a follow-up and was doing quite well. So in conclusion, these are relatively uncommon injuries, but they're not as benign as uh, once people thought them to be. And some of these, uh, if managed conservatively, do end up in trouble. Uh, you need to assess them carefully. Today, I think a CT scan is almost mandatory before you decide on fixing these fractures. And you really need to get anatomical reduction and good internal fixation so that you can start early range of motion to expect good results in this. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen and we'll open it for questions. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. So I think uh, if a postgraduate have some question, can you please ask? Uh, meanwhile, sir, sir, uh, yeah. is it uh, there is one more a thing like percutaneous screw fixation or percutaneous k wire fixation is described. Is it so? I think uh, you uh, the problem with these are that the ones there's displacement in the articular area and it's very difficult to assess just on uh, C arm pictures as to how well you've reduced it. Okay, now if it's a completely undisplaced one and you think you need to fix it, then maybe you can do percutaneous fixations or uh, fractures where you have a lateral epicondyle uh, involvement without a significant displacement of the uh, capitella or trochlear fracture. But by and large, you want anatomical reduction, and that means you need to look at your reduction to be able to be sure. Otherwise, you, you're bound to be uh, misled. Uh, so I don't think uh, personally for displaced fractures, percutaneous fixation is a good idea for these, but things may change. So, uh, do you need that headless screw for fixation of these or? Yeah, so it depends. So you can fix them from front to back with headless screws or back to front with uh, regular screws. Okay, because the front would be articular, so it has to go be countersunk. The other things we use sometimes, as you know, we use the uh, 3.5 millimeter locking head screws because it's easier to counter sink. So either headless screws or 3.5 millimeter uh, locking head screws. We also, for many of them, put screws across from the capitulum across into the trochlea or onto the medial side because I think some of them will not get adequate fixation from the front to back uh, fixations. So some of them, if it's especially if it's a large large jump. We like to get wires or screws, threaded wires or screws across from the capitulum into the medial part of the trochlea. So, which one you prefer, posterior to anterior or anterior to posterior? So, it really depends on the position. So, if I can get solid posterior to anterior screws, I prefer them. But wherever, it's because you can judge exactly where they are going out. Okay. In the front to back screws, of course, you can do that. but Again, if you have a large junk, then you have very little hold on the posterior side. Okay? So you have to judge between that which works better for you. And similarly, if you have a 
posterior comminution, then again the front to back screw, whether it's threaded or uh, whether it's uh, uh, headless or not, will not work because then you're not going to get hold in the posterior side. Okay, so, so then you need to rely on screws across to the thing and maybe some buttress on the posterolateral aspect to put screws in, so either a plate or something. So, uh, for those fractures, sir, when there is posterior combination, is there any uh, role of bone graft in those? Or? Not in fresh fractures. Very, I mean, nowadays for fresh fractures, uh, in most places we have gone away from bone grafting, except where uh, you feel that there's going to be a big gap, which is going to cause a problem with the stability of your fixation. But uh, it's unusual if you can get a good reduction. Uh, you have some very rarely have to put in bone graft. I think in open fractures where bone has been lost and you are trying to reconstruct it once uh, the soft tissue is okay, that may be an option. But not for close, very rare, not really for closed fractures. And uh, what uh, what is the for neglected your... cases? Sir, uh, sir, the question is, uh, what we are doing for if to avoid the post-operative stiffness, because that is so for that you need to get good fixation, which allows you to start early motion. So most of these we we do give them a cast in extension usually and start mobilizing from the second day by cutting out the front of the cast. So very rarely would we put them in cast for long uh, for. I mean, not mobilize them within the first couple of days after surgery. And so, for isolated trochlear fracture, you have shown uh, one case, sir. In that case, sir, you have shown that there is one screw from front to back and another one is the probably threaded cable. Fire through, from... which goes through from the lateral side through the trochlear fragment into the medial side. Because okay. uh, the approach was from the lateral side in that particular case. And so, uh, one more uh, thing, what you have mentioned in your uh, lecture, that for the uh, trochlear fixation through the phalanges of capitulum, what that means, sir, it is the lateral flange. So, the lateral flange which the distal humerus plate has. Okay, sir. Okay, okay. okay sir. So, yes, through sir. that, you can put in screws across into the medial side. Okay, sir. So, in Duberly paper, sir, they have mentioned uh, the approach as a posterior approach. What so for that you have to do a posterior approach. Okay, sir. When the posterior and wall is, uh, is comminuted, then you might need to do a posterior approach because your plate will be at the back. Okay, sir. Sir, even for capitulum fracture, uh, he has also mentioned posterior approach for that. Yeah, for the capitulum. So you can. You can do a posterolateral approach, but if you have to go medially, you have a problem. So you have to judge based on your x-rays and CT where, which way you would approach. Okay? So if you noticed my slide approach, it said posterior or lateral approach. But we prefer the lateral approach in most of this unless we have to put a plate posteriorly, then we'll go posterior. Because we like to visualize the anterior part of the articular surface to get a good look at it. So I think uh, most of the thing we have covered, sir, and we're waiting for, if yeah. anyone have some doubt, then you please ask. I have not, from the postgraduate, we have not any questions. So, so if there are no further questions, I think we can call it a day. It's an, a, a shorter talk because it was a short yes, topic on the whole. So... Most of the thing I think, uh, okay. Yeah, okay, so thank you so much, Bye. sir. It was great, sir. thank Bye. you. Sir.